I might have to kind of quickly go through these slides since we're still a little late and I got You're sounding a little bit muffled. All right. Got an 80 year rotation I'm trying to get to. How's that? I think if you hold still, so, so far so good. <laughs> I'll try not to move too much. Um, Obviously, oaks are very important to Missouri. Um, if you look at the oak distribution here, I uh, really, there's a lot of pool in Missouri. We are the leading state for white oaks uh, throughout the nation. And we produce, as far as oaks go, we produce. You're, you're still cutting out. I'm sorry to interrupt. You're still cutting out pretty bad. Is it possible that you're able to do it without the headset? No luck. What about if I bring it right to my mic? That, that is a little bit better. Yeah, then I just can't hear you. <laughs> okay, but we can hear you good that okay. way. Maybe that's better. So that, that's working. All right. Man, try this again. <laughs> Let's just, obviously you guys know that white oaks are very important to Missouri. We are the top white oak stave producer in the world. So there's a lot of stave companies that have um, centered in Missouri and a lot of them buy white oak bolts and staves um, from Missouri. So we have some of the three largest stave companies are Cooperage County, Cooperage companies in the world here. And if we look at kind of the trend for um, prices for staves, um, this is out of Kentucky, but you can kind of see the trend is, is an ever increasing um, value for our white oak staves. And I believe in Missouri, there was a little bit of drip in 2018, but uh, on average, it's pretty high. So unfortunately, much of uh, the timber in Missouri is getting to be kind of in that larger diameter class uh, compared to the, the younger diameter class. So we're starting to see, you know, stuff start to age out a little bit. And this is a, a diagram from Indiana, but it kind of represents what's happening throughout much of the eastern states where uh, we have here in the blue, we have um, the in the bottom, the diameter from left to right is kind of increasing diameter classes. And then the vertical axis is percent stems. So you can see in the blue, the oaks represent uh, much larger diameter classes. And then what's in the smaller diameter classes is stuff like um, the maples, the the uh, other hardwoods and beach. Oops. And as over time, what's gonna happen is these more mesic shade tolerant species are going to be moving to the right. So they're gonna be kind of taking up a lot of that larger diameter classes in the future. And then of course, we all know about some of the mortality that's going on in our oaks and our white oaks. And in this study from 2012, 2017, just five years, we have the number of white oaks has decreased by 3%. And then the annual mortality of white oaks has doubled in that time period. And this is resulting in about a 30% decrease in annual net growth. And because of this oak decline and lack of regeneration started, there's a group called the White Oak Initiative, which is composed of a lot of industry, uh, state agencies, universities, and other organizations working to ensure the long-term sustainability of Americans' white oaks. So if you haven't checked them out, go to their website. They're a relatively new group. So we should be hearing a lot more from this group in the future. A lot of the research currently is kind of coming out of Kentucky. And for this presentation, you know, oak, getting oaks back into your woods is nothing new. There's been a lot of studies done on it. So these are just some of the publications that I use for this presentation, but they even have some computer modeling like Silva out there that'll help predict um, 
you know, how many oaks that you need to have regenerate in your, your understory and, and what sort of thinning cycles you need to be using. So with that, I want to go hit some of the main three keys to oak management. And these, this is oak management in existing oak stands. So first of all, we're talking about having adequate advanced oak regeneration. And with that is adequate numbers of oak, uh, adequate height and size of oaks, and the ability to grow rapidly. And then secondly, a timely release of oak regeneration. So this should result in a rapid oak height growth so that they can outcompete other species that are growing next to them. And then finally, following up management. So controlling invasive species, you know, um, coming from Indiana and Indiana is just riddled with invasive species out in the woods. They use, um, you know, our brush management practice is our, lead, our second top used practice in Indiana. So uh, oaks or invasive species are, are here, they're here to stay and they're probably gonna get worse. But also follow up management. So thinning, other improvements and doing a timber harvesting. And if you see, all of these are forms of disturbance. Oaks are adapted to disturbance. So the more disturbance that we cause, the more likely we are to get oaks um, to regenerate. And now thinking about civil culture, you know, we have, well, this is probably gonna be reviewed for some of you foresters out there, but even age and uneven age civil culture. So I won't bore you with all the specifics, but you know, single tree selection, uh, that's not very commonly used with oak management unless you have more like a, a very dry site, more of a savanna sort of situation. But that tends to uh, perpetuate more shade tolerant species like your maples. And then group selection, uh, it can be used a little bit with oak management, but there again, you really want xeric sites, dry sites, um, because if you get other more faster growing species like tulip or ash growing up, they can dominate over oaks. Same thing with clear cuts. Um, they're usually commonly used in more xeric conditions. Seed tree method, we don't see that too often used for oak regeneration. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is, is shelter wood and shelter wood harvest. And that's really the preferred method for generating oak on some of these more productive, more mesic sites. So we're looking at site indexes of, you know, 65 to probably 75. So here I've created a little timeline. Um, you know, the exact year is probably not too important because you can't always plan to the exact year, but uh, we're going through a, a roughly a 70 year rotation here. And we're gonna start out with uh, evaluating the oak regeneration and the oaks overstory. When I talk about overstory, we want at least 50% of oaks that are producing acorns. Here, I took this picture just a few weeks ago. And as you can see, there's, you know, a lot of oaks growing up in the understory. They're spaced about every two to three to five feet. So we have several hundred, probably 400 to, you know, maybe 800 stems out there of oaks, and which is great, but they're a little small. They're only about one foot to two foot in height. So right now it's a little bit too early to know if these are gonna be able to compete with your faster growing species and make it to the, to the canopy in the future. So what we want is something more like this, where we have something more in that four to six height and um, at least three quarters of an inch in diameter and at least a hundred oak trees per acre, having more is better. Um, a, lot of, a lot of research says, you know, 400-ish and even parts of Pennsylvania where they have a lot of deer damage, they're talking about wanting regeneration of, you know, a thousand or thousands of oaks per acre. But I think we can work with a little bit lower numbers as long as we make sure that they're not going to be outcompeted by other faster growing species. And something to note too, this is not the perfect picture, but we do want to maintain um, apical dominance of those oaks that are growing up. So, um, you know, over time, if you don't remove the overstory on oaks, they tend to kind of kind of cap out. And when you lose the apical dominance, they slow down in height growth and that could allow for another species to 
to overtop them and overtake them. So here we've done our evaluation. You know, if you have that adequate oak regeneration, you can move right into a timber harvest. So you could do one of those clear cuts or uh, forced openings or something like that if you already have the oak regeneration there. But oftentimes on these more mesic sites, we just don't have the oak regeneration. So we got to do some understory and midstory removal and treating of invasives and possibly even some prescribed burns. So here's, this is called a, the preparatory cutter first stage and we're removing the understory, midstory and invasives and in, possibly including some fire, but I'm gonna move this around here. Um, we're looking at, you know, this developing within three to five years. And these are all disturbance. This can be a lot of work. And the more work, the more disturbance you do, potentially the more oaks that you could get to regenerate. Now, a lot of you may already know this, you know, why are oaks kind of slow growing initially? It's because they're spending a lot of their energy into growing a root system. And that root system will allow them to re-sprout readily. So here we have a red maple and its root system is pretty small. So when something like this, when fire kind of comes through and it kills the tops of, you know, all the trees, then your oaks have got that root system energy stored up in the root system to be able to re-sprout and grow rapidly. Whereas the maples and other, you know, non-fire dependent species are not able to grow as rapidly after being set back like this. So what we don't want to happen is this, where our oaks get overtaken by faster growing species like poplar and, and maple. And, you know, we're going to utilize the fact that um, oaks are a little bit more sh shade intermediate when they're young, so that we're gonna manage the shade out there for to prevent these tulip and ash from, from getting into that understory and outgrowing the oaks. And we probably need to use some herbicides. So if you're already coming into a, a stand that has say maples in the understory or just any undesirable species, looking at doing it, herbicide application on those sprouts. Whereas if you have some oaks that kind of has lost that apical dominance, you know, this is where you would do kind of a cut low and allow them to re-sprout. So I had kind of fun kind of making this picture in some of these pictures. And um, so this is an example of a woods. It's probably an even age woods, even though there's multiple sizes of trees out there, but we first start out with an understory treatment, removing the understory, and then possibly removing this kind of mid-story um, and really keeping that, that canopy intact. So that's gonna allow some shade, some light to kind of come, come down to the forest floor and regenerate some of the trees. And some of those smaller trees that we removed, hopefully some of them are oaks, so we can kind of expect a 50 to 80% of those oaks are gonna re-sprout from stumps, as long as those trees are, are under the age 65. Once they become a little bit older, older than 65, the, uh, the chance of them re-sprouting is a lot lower. So again, here we have our stand. And if you're not getting the oak regeneration, that you expect. This is something that Art might want to look into is removing a few more trees kind of in that intermediate to kind of lower canopy position. And if you can, hopefully that is able to be a timber harvest. So oftentimes we call this um, a improvement harvest. And if you can remove anything that's harvestable, you know, try to do that there. And so we still, after that harvest, we still have a relatively intact forest canopy, you know, no major gaps in it, but we're allowing sunlight on that forest floor. Here's a visual picture of that, of a shelterwood harvest um, where they, you know, <clears throat> still have the canopy of large residual trees and kept, you know, the gaps fairly small to allow sunlight into that forest floor. Here's another picture where uh, on the right is an understory treatment. They really haven't removed any overstory yet, but you can see that kind of diffuse sunlight reaching that forest floor, 
allowing the oaks to grow up, where on the left is the untreated, uh, much more shade in there. And then again, if we look from down below up, on the left we have before herbicide, before that treatment, only 2% full sun. You know, really only your, your maples and stuff like that can grow in those conditions. Where after our treatment, we have 18% sunlight. Again, you look up there, there's no major gaps in that overstory and we can start to get some oaks to start to regenerate and grow. What we want to avoid is this, any large major gaps. Now these two dead trees might have kind of contributed to this gap, but we want to stay away from a lot of sunlight reaching that forest floor because we're really only going to get tulip poplar and ash, you know, to grow up. So here we have our forest again. We allow three to five years or maybe even more than five years for that understory of oaks to develop. And then we do our timber harvest. So um, I guess backing up though, you know, we want to make sure that that understory is meets that requirements and they have that apical dominance on those little four to six foot tall oaks. And also in this time, sometimes some invasives like Asian bush honeysuckle or, you know, a lot of different invasives could come in whenever you start to open things up. So you want to control invasives. And, you know, if you have even maples, once you start opening up that stand, those maples might start to, to come up so that you would want to treat those within this time period. So here we, we've done that over understory removal, and then we can kind of evaluate our oak regeneration, and then we can move on to removing the overstory. So here's our forest again. We got oaks growing in the uh, forest floor, and we do our timber harvest. We want to really open it up, kind of almost do kind of ending up with almost like a clear cut or almost a seed tree cut. You can leave a few out there, but you don't really want to leave too much. You could possibly leave as much as 20 basal area and maybe even 30 basal area and a few little isolated spots. But, you know, the more basal area, the tree, larger trees you leave out there that could stunt that apical dominance and the, or the trees are going to grow around and try and get at that sunlight. So you really want to remove as much as the overstory as possible. And then we're going to kind of move on to the next stage here is after about five years doing a young crop tree release. So here we, hopefully the trees are actually larger than this, but we want to avoid this situation where, you know, our, our oaks are out there and they get overtaken by faster growing species. So we want to kind of, if we're only going to have a few hundred oaks per acre, we're really going to have to baby those oaks. And we're going to do this by a crop tree release. And that really crop tree release, when we think of removing certain sides of the trees, we're really removing that overstory competition with those oaks. And about this time is also a good time if you have stump sprouts to clip some of those multi-stem sprouts. And so here's our, our long-term layout, and we're gonna kind of move into the next stage, which is our, our thinning stage. And hopefully some of this thinning, you're able to do you know, a timber harvest or improvement harvest cut on it. And maybe this is something that Art might wanna try, is putting a little bit of fire into the stands to help germinate some of those acorns. But what we want to do is we want to keep fire out of stands like this, kind of that young pull stage stands, because when we're talking about timber production, you know, we can kind of kind of hamper and ruin some of that timber production at this stage. So here we're going to use our handy dandy stocking chart. So we're going from an overstock condition, uh, thinning down to Six, around 60% or that B line stocking height. And, you know, that C line or that, uh, that B line is, is about at canopy closure. So hopefully we're also getting some regeneration of some oaks in the understory at that time. But we're gonna allow, you know, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years for that stand to start to, to grow in height. 
And so we're going to come up to not quite that A line. We don't want to go all the way up to that 100% stocking, but maybe at the 90% stocking, because this is still a forest situation. If you had open woodland, you might want to only go up to 80 or even 70% stocking. And then we're going to thin down. So we're doing that understory thinning from below, taking out smaller diameter. So we're going to increase the diameter through that harvest or that thinning operation. Again, uh, thinning down to somewhere close to that B line. And then again, allowing it to grow up. And, you know, throughout these thinning processes, if you start to run into oak mortality, hopefully you've been thinning from below and, you know, taking out undesirable trees and tree species so that hopefully you are developing some of that understory oak regeneration while you're doing these thinnings. And then after, again, after about 15, 20 years of growth, you know, we're getting some really great diameter um, in, in those trees. So hopefully, you know, this last thinning operation is really more like a timber harvest. And then, you know, doing that harvest down to the B line. And then again, finally, hopefully get some big growth out of it and, and letting it go up to closer to that A line and then doing that overstory removal. So to kind of throw another complication in on this, you know, invasive species are here. They've, they're going to probably just get worse. So, you know, also consider going into your forest every five to 10 years and treating invasives. I uh, probably don't have a lot of time, but there are, you know, several states and several um, places have kind of looked at what would be good rotations based on side index for white oaks. But probably in this area, you know, we're looking at probably a, anywhere from a 80 to a 90 year rotation to get kind of some of those larger diameter oaks. Um, and I think we should really be, you know, reaching for those 24, even 26 inch diameter oaks if we want to increase the value there probably don't have a lot of time to go through this slide, but this is some, a study, an actual um, site in Pennsylvania that looked at increasing, you know, letting things grow up to more of a veneer quality size and going from a 15 inch to a 19 inch where now that 19 inch is a veneer quality tree and they not only improved, doubled the, the per board footage value, but they increased that total tree value by you know, 300%. So it really, it pays to keep, you know, the trees there and keep them, grow them bigger if you can. And again, it, it mentioned too, absolutely no damage. Once you damage those root systems, you damage anything on that tree, you've kind of taken them out of that veneer quality uh, potential. But, you know, stay prices are still pretty good. So we can still get some pretty good prices out of our, out of our oaks. Um, but that publication is Penn State um, Managing Small Woodlots, so you can read it for yourself to give a little bit of advice on, on some stewardship and, and making sure that you don't destroy what's out there in your woodlot. So again, just a final wrap up. Sorry for the, the quick rush on this, but, you know, the keys to oak management is having adequate events oak regeneration, timely release of oak regeneration, and follow-up management. And disturbance, disturbance, disturbance. The more disturbance you do, the more likely you are to get oaks back. And that's it. All right, thank you, Brian. Does anyone have any questions for Brian? Give it a minute and see if anyone has anything. I'm not seeing anything pop up. Sorry, I had to rush through that. No, it was perfect. Thank you. I'm glad we got your audio working. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. 